Hello. So thank you all for coming. So I'm present in the room and online. Uh, we are really, really happy today to have uh, Gustavo Campbells, who is uh, here. Uh, so Gustavo is, uh, is a full professor of electrical engineering at the uh, Universidad de Valencia. Uh, he's a group leader of his team, distinguished lecturer and IEEE fellow, and he's also an ELIS fellow uh, and program coordinator. Uh, he's also leading and, and still leading uh, really large research projects, ERC projects. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about AI and earth system. So thank you very much, Gustavo, for coming. Uh, I will let you. Uh, I will let you uh, do your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rani, for the for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, today it's really a good pleasure to be here. And, and actually, I have to tell, of course, an anecdote. This is my first talk, I would say, in two years or so in person. So I do not really cannot remember very well how to perform in public. Uh, I almost uh, forget about it. Well, anyway, uh, today I'm going to talk about recent advances that we have been doing in the lab and also uh, elsewhere in um, AI for modeling and understanding. I will emphasize through the talk this word understanding rather than predicting or picking. Uh, in particular, the focus on in our lab and also in other labs is on the earth system science. So I will touch upon different topics. Mainly, you have it in the in this slide, in the introduction slide, the physics of machine learning, uh, interpretability, and causality. How we are doing these things in the Earth system science, but of course, you can you can uh, figure it out that these methods that I'm going to present will be useful also for other other domain sciences. Okay, so let's see if this works. Okay, bonjour. Uh, this, this is uh, my first like uh, icebreaker slide. Um, and a bit of uh, promotion of the city and the group. This is uh, Valencia, uh, the region, and I'm flying back and forth from Valencia to Paris uh, every now and then. So uh, we will have time for, for chatting in person around the city here. Uh, the group is the Emission Signal Processing Group. We are roughly 40 people and growing. We are always hiring smart people. So feel free to, to come and visit and chat. And, and what I'm going to present in this in this uh, in this lecture, it is the result of many years of collaboration with many different people, with many different labs, and, and also with the support of many different uh, companies and organizations. So, so of course, I have to acknowledge all of them. Um, the outline of the presentation, I try to to split this this presentation in three parts. The first one is a more introductory part on how things are done. Typically, uh, when you want to apply machine learning for the earth sciences, I will give you a bunch of examples, and then I will I will try to put uh, like you know to put forward the, the main problems that we are uh, that we are already seeing in the near and ad hoc application of machine learning for the earth sciences. Namely, are the methods that we are applying or the models that we are developing consistent with the laws of physics. And then for the third part, I will ask further, are they explainable? Are they interpretable, robust? Or they are just like uh, black boxes that fit very well? And then of course, uh, we will, uh, and we are actually looking for, for the, 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 the main holy grail of, of, of learning or understanding systems, which is causality. And I will tell you some examples uh, about how things are done. Okay, let's go for the, for the simpler, uh, more introductory part, uh, the machine learning for the earth sciences and how things are done. Well, this is our little lovely object that we are interested about. This is the earth. It looks very innocent, very, very simple, but it is not that innocent, it's very complicated. It is a highly connected, complex network system with tons of processes going on at different temporal and spatial scales. And we want to not only model, model the system, but also understand it and, and to find projections about the state of the system in the future, right? Um, and for that, we typically, we use a lot of physics, but also now very recently in the last decade or so, the, the impact of AI has been tremendous in, in this, in this, in this uh, um, scientific domain. So here you have some instantations in a very nice video of different variables that we are interested in monitoring on in, in our system. For example, methane, evaporation, carbon dioxide, etc. 
uh, we call this uh, data cubes. Okay, so you have a cube that has a spatial but also temporal coordinates, and this is a constant influx of data, massive data. This is just an example of a particular spatial and temporal resolution, but you may imagine that you can go from meters to kilometers, depending on the sensor and the, and the acquisition system. And this is how this system is actually helping us to, um, to, to monitor, for example, vegetation. In this case, you can see how the cross primary productivity is evolving in this region of Africa. So you can actually uh, uh, capture how vegetation is doing and the health status and, and vital signs of the earth that are performing. Of course, the variables are interrelated. So it is not just one unique variable, but it is a multivariate problem, multidimensional and spatial temporally correlated at different, at different relationships and at different scales. Okay. So this is the, the main goal. So how to extract information out of this large data. And we do many things. For example, we use these data cubes in order to predict the crop yield from space. So you can actually uh, uh, measure and estimate what would be the, the harvest uh, uh, of a particular season and a particular uh, crop of interest. But you can also be interested in monitoring our coastline and the ocean, for example, by retrieving parameters of interest like the crop. Uh, like a chlorophyll content, or maybe maybe water quality indicators, or things like that. Of course, a lot of people is working, and we are also doing so, um, monitoring the atmosphere, for example, or the air quality indicators. Here, for example, you see a, a, a European map of the the retrieval of NO2 is uh, that is a nitrogen um, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen dioxide in a tropospheric column integrated. Um, and, and you can see that, well, for example, Paris is not the best place to live in Europe. Um, so this will be important to not only, and it has a lot of implications in this, on the you know, uh, quality of life and also the health issues and, and how to monitor how the population is doing. Um, and there are many different trade uh, uh, gases that can be monitored and many different algorithms have been applying. Uh, has been applied for not only modeling but also predicting and, and forecasting this quantities, right? But we are not only interested in estimating but also in detecting what is anomalous, what is strange, right? We are living in an era where the, this system is largely evolving and there are tons of uh, different discriminants. Um, and this is one particular discriminant. This is an example. Uh, in the year 2010, you can see for the, to, to the months that the algorithm is trying to detect what is anomalous. I mean, what is what is the, the, the temperature anomaly with respect to previous years? And he has detected a particularly interesting blob here around the uh, around the, the region in, in Russia um, that it can detect in time and delineate very well in space so you can basically retrieve some spatial temporal uh, um, uh, uh, anomaly descriptors, let's say. And this corresponded to the 2010 Russian heat wave. This was a massive heat wave that caused a lot of a lot of losses in terms of you know crops and, and but also uh, casualties. And this way we we can not only delineate and detect now uh, but with machine learning we can anticipate it. But for that, we need a lot of data, a lot of computers, and, and a lot of uh, efficient models for doing so. Right? Okay, and, and in this context, we are well aware that machine learning is, play, is playing a big role these days. Um, the, but the main mode of machine learning is always the same, right? Uh, give the power to the data, and with enough data and large computers, we will be able to solve every, any, any problem at hand, right? Um, I'm going to summarize like in very three simple slides. What is the, what are the architectures or what are the methods that are helping use in, in machine learning for your sciences? Uh, I noticed before that we are dealing with spatial temporal data structures, right? So typically people started applying convolutional neural networks, but then they realized that the, 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 the process is also all the time. So this is a standard architecture that people are using, which is the combination of a convolutional neural network and an LSTM layer, in order to, you know, to, to, to 
to combine both uh, both uh, modalities of the data. No? And this has been used for detection, but also for prediction of, of some biophysical parameters. But you can go also probabilistic. And, and in this arena where you have tons and tons of data to predict on, but you don't have too many data to learn from. Um, so your databases for training are typically very small because they they come from very few campaigns, so you don't have a lot of time and effort and, and, and so and resources to, to sample uh, properly. In these situations, structuring processes and probabilistic learning has been playing a, a fundamental role. And now Gaussian processes can scale very well, let's say to about a hundred thousand points or something like that. And in this case, for example, we were we were able to, to deploy a, a GP um, for uh, cloud detection uh, that we designed this Gaussian process to be efficient, but also to incorporate the spatial and control structures into the kernel function. Um, but as I told you, it is important to account for the space, the space and time relationship. And this is a common place in many areas, not only in neuroscience. sciences. You may think on climate informatics and neuroscience and in, in signal processing and natural language, language processing, of course. So of course, this, this combination of, of CNNs plus LSTNs, they can uh, work very well. But now there are novel ma methods and approaches that promise like great advantages. Note, for example, that we here in this field, we have like a mismatch between the resolution that you are able to acquire, let's say, uh, with a satellite sensor. Uh, but then you don't have for every pixel, uh, let's say, a particular estimate, a particular parameter. You have maybe just one measurement for the whole area, for the whole parcel or region. Uh, it is the case, for example, of cross yield estimation, right? So you have a production number their parcel or their area. So how to work with this distribution data? How to work with distribution to label, not just label to label, right? Not, 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 sorry, not just feature vector to, to label. So this is the case of distribution regression uh, methodologies and, and they have been using quite, quite, uh, quite a lot in the in recent years. And also, of course, deep learning in all its variety and deep caution processes as well, because and it is very important. I would like to highlight and to emphasize this that in this area we are very, very interested not only in the point-wise estimate but also in the confidence of the prediction. It is even more and more, more important for us. Okay, so apparently we are all done with uh, machine learning for the sciences. Everything, you know, just did incorrectly because we can relate, we can classify, we can detect, everything is solved, right? So yeah, but. It is not actually the case. Uh, if you look at the literature, not only the 99% of the papers that they just focus on improving the accuracy by 1% or 2% or something like that, if you look at the nature and science covers, um, it looks like AI not only is excelling in many, many different fields, but also it is actually promising to transform science, the scientific discovery and labor as a whole. So, with data and models, in principle, you should be able to, to, to do everything, right? So this is the, the big promise. Um, but yeah, it is also the same thing in, in, in your sciences. We have data, we have models, we have computers. Uh, in this paper, in this nature paper, and in this book, we are actually approaching the problem from a different perspective. You can tell the title. I mean, you can tell, tell it from the title deep learning and process understanding. So, what we are promoting here is the interaction between these two, in principle, irreconcilable fields, right? Uh, on the one side of the pendulum, you have deep learning that only focuses on data, and data is enough, and that's the whole trial, and everything is solved with uh, data because you expect the data will act as an efficient regularizer. And on the other hand, on, on the other hand, you have on the other side of the pendulum, you have physics that rely on laws, laws that are invariant. So it looks like they are kind of irreconcilable fields, right? But in this particular uh, perspective paper, what we were actually uh, interested in is in trying to merge these two fields in order to make not only models more efficient and, and consistent, but also to learn something about the, the system itself. Okay. 
Okay, so this apparently, I mean, the deep learning era <coughs> has come and works perfectly fine as well in earth sciences. But only when some things happen, when you have a strong spatial and temporal correlation that happens, when you have big data, when you have cheap computing and fast and scalable machine learning models, and it is typically argued that machine learning or health sciences or machine learning in general is working because in reality you don't need any extra knowledge or you are only interested in high accuracy you don't you are not particularly interested in learning anything so side note why do we call it learning right so you should be understanding something no? and, and then since understanding is the system is irrelevant and you only are concerned about accuracy well of course you're done but if you are doing more you should be quite concerned at this point um and these are like the deep learning or the machine learning challenges that i foresee in the future and actually they're already happening the first one and it is quite annoying when you speak to physicists is that models machine learning models or deep learning models do not respect necessarily the, the laws of physics like the conservation of mass or energy and this is quite annoying and actually nobody will buy a deep learning model that has no physical but conservative fundamental fundamental constraints right then the other the other question that i would like to to create in this talk is that these models apparently they work fine they predict well but how do we know what this what how what this what these models learn actually learn right so are they interpretable they can be explained somehow and the third one is that by training a particular model, you are assuming that X is always causing Y, but there are other interactions and there are other cause and effect relationships given with the, within the same axis and Y, right? So these three topics are the, the topics that I'm going to talk about uh, in this, this presentation. Of course, not everything's dark and obscure and, and problematic. There are there is some light at the end of the tunnel, and we will uh, try to, to see what is being doing in the machine learning, for example, for incorporating physics, interpreting the models, and jumping from the pure mere uh, fitting paradigm to the understanding and result. Okay, so let's move on now to the part two, which is the machine learning should respect physics. And uh, the idea is here. The idea is very simple. So most of the times you want to learn f that takes x's and then tries to detect y's. And then the, in this new field of physics aware machine learning, you try to incorporate some laws that should create, that should be respected somehow, right? Uh, you will find the term physics aware machine learning in different, in different, uh, um, in different similar concepts like in physics guided, physics informed or physics constrained, or even science guided, right? That will depend on the author and the community because, and it is just like a very uh, subtle um, a distinction. And of, of course, you know, promoted by your, your own interest. Are you believing that the machine learning is the, is the model and then you incorporate uh, the physics or the other way around? It is physics that should be fixed, and then you can enrich the physics or learn new physics from data uh, with machine learning, right? So this uh, I wanted to, to make this this uh, clear distinction. I will be referring to physics aware machine learning because my main predictive model will be a machine learning model, and then I will try to, to, to constrain the, the space of solutions with uh, with physics. Okay. Uh, the truth is that the, the, the community is turning to, to this physics aware machine learning quite quite uh, quite vastly. Um, everything started, let's say, with this nice uh, presentation uh, I attended some years ago in APU. So you can you can really model with a fat with a data or fantasy, data with a model that cares or kind of, right? I mean that is very <laughs> it's very uh, a little provocative statement, but anyway, uh, this is the motivation for what we are actually doing in the physics or machine learning. And here we propose like a very simple taxonomy in the ways that machine learning and physics can interact. For example, in the box A, you have data and model interactions. 
or blending. So you want to combine in a single model both observational data and uh, simulations coming from models, right? From clinical models. There are many ways of doing this. So in DevOps D, maybe you're interested in another type of, uh, of uh, communication between machine learning and physics. You want to replace the physical model with some surrogate model uh, coming from machine learning that is more efficient, faster, right? And then we can infer it from some of the population. Uh, in block box C, maybe you're interested in learning some obscure heuristic parameters of physical models, because do not forget, physical models are like machine learning models, are just models, right? So yes, an approximation of reality. And then maybe in some time, in, in some cases, you are interested in, in estimating those parameters more efficiently, or let's say uh, more objectively. Mm. Um, and, the, and the fourth way I would say is that of learning physics from data. I will show you some examples of, of, of methods that are very so asking something or so yeah. So let's move on. I, I will just try to summarize some examples of, of every of every methodology here. Uh, and I will start from the simplest case, right? The simplest case is to reformulate your, your loss into a physical law. How do we do this uh, when you want to incorporate a particular prior in your, in your, in your algorithm, a particular inductive bias if you want? Uh, well, just plug in a, a new regularizer. And people who have been doing so uh, in, the, in this context of constraint optimization with physics based regularizer. Okay? Uh, like in this case, for example, the authors were interested in predicting the temperature at different, uh, different layers in, 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 in lakes. And they noted that they could do it very well, but uh, there were some erratic behavior and some erratic uh, predictions uh, as, as you go through the layers in the lake. Right? So they, they observed this and said, okay, uh, we know that the depth uh, and the density and the density in tem temperature are related. And as you go through the, through the layer in the lake, the density should increase. So, and this is related to temperature. So they design a regularizer that is posed in the as a third term in the physical laws that eventually was just penalizing all the discrepancies or violations of this simple physical rule, physical law. Okay. So that was simple and it worked very well. And what the authors also observed is that the model could extrapolate to unseen lakes because this is a fundamental law that it, is, it has to be fulfilled in all the lakes that you can. Okay. Well, we came up with an, a new approach uh, because in the previous approach, we, um, the authors, um, the authors are basically proposed a uh, L two norm uh, mean square error for for measuring the discrepancies with the physical law, and they could only use like one law at a time. In this particular case, what we reformulated this was in, in terms of, of kernel methods, and for and instead of, of talking about MC or correlation, we used uh, an independent criterion called ASIC, the inverse smooth independent criterion, that it is zero if and only if the two variables, the prediction and the physical law, are fully independent. So what it is nice is that instead of a normal network, you use kernel methods, kernel regression, everything comes in post form solution, which is only have to resort to this uh, to this particular uh, inverse that you see in the, in the slide. And what it is also interesting is that, it, is that it is very, very clear that physics here, motivated from the field of algorithmic fairness, by the way, it is acting as a very explicit regularizer. Right, sum uh, over the, the kernel function or the kernel, or the kernel and of course we we came up with a probabilistic version interpreted uh, from a Gaussian process, so we can derive the Gaussian process. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's exactly the same thing. Here you see that it's omega. Yeah, yeah but it's not. <laughs> okay, so you have this omega, right? Uh, that it is basically uh, an MAC, what the author proposed here. 
what we are replacing this is with uh well there are, have been some other authors that propose neutral information but again it is costly you know you have to to different some some parameters and it is not very limited right and in ASIC, we are doing exactly the same thing replacing this omega with a uh, independent criterion um so instead of measuring let's say parallel of course, you turn this plus into a minus and promote this under. Okay. I will show you uh, an example in, in, uh, in this case. For example, you are interested in predicting temperature anomalies uh, with the years, right? Uh, and you are ingesting different variables like from an anthropogenic uh, factors to natural factors. And then you want to check. What is the important thing here? No? What is driving this temperature anomaly increase? No, that we have been seeing, we have been observing in the last few years. No, so basically you did a lot of different models, models for predicting temperature anomalies. Well, and at the same time they should be independent of the natural factors, or you develop another one that should be independent of, of anthropogenic factors. Okay, and then. You can see that you cannot actually predict well while being consistent uh, with the with the hypothesis that the humans do not have anything to do with it, right? Uh, and then you can plot this, let's say, uh, uh, high confront of accuracy of the model with consistency, with classical consistency, and you can summarize this curve into basically just like a uh, yeah, uh, sum uh, or area under this curve. You can summarize this as a kind of uh, um, accuracy consistent uh, score, let's say. No? And what we basically would think is that the most important variables in order to explain this increase in temperature were the aerosols and the greenhouse gas emissions, which was suspected. And this is a very simple for example. Okay. Okay, let's jump to the second approach where we typically have data, observational data, but we also have some. Some models, let's say, or either climate models or uh, gravity transfer models when we are working with remote sensors. No? In this case, we wanted to incorporate those, I mean, to design a machine learning model that could actually blend these two sources of information. We derive a, a particular regression process called the joint GB, the joint partial process, that it is able to ingest and to weight or down weight each piece of information and learn the hyperparameter that considers this or that more important in the end for prediction. And what it is nice is that you can work with different domains with different ranges of domain. For example, in the figure on the left, you can see that the that the the well uh, the, the dashed line, which is under GP, it is performing very well because it passes through the training set, which are basically the dots uh, in blue. It does very well, but then what happens when you are trying to predict outside the, 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 the in sample domain? Well, what happens is, is that uh, predictions are tending to the prior, so zero prior, zero mean prior, and then the confidence intervals like yeah, they increase a lot because you have not seen any data in those regions, so you, you are completely uncertain, right? Then, on the contrary, when you uh, embed new data coming from simulations and simulations are, are nice because they can compass all the on the range right um, then the algorithm in solid red line here it performs very well there because it is actually given like a lot of credit to the observational data and then outside the region he says okay i don't have real data real observational data so so what do i have i have simulations so then i will try to follow the simulation right so it is actually compensating these two sources of information. And then what is also nice is that the confidence intervals are expected to uh, diminish uh, quite, quite well. So we use this simple uh, GP into a particular uh, problem in remote sensing, which is the prediction of leaf area index. So how much, how many leaves do you have in a square meter, right? Roughly speaking. So we use satellite data uh, coming from Lancet. <laughs> And then we used uh, simulations <coughs> from a particular reality model called the same. So in the end, at the end of the day, you have both X and Y coming from observations, but also coming from simulations. And then we have interestingly three campaigns in Spain, Greece, and Italy, 
And then you can see here, like in this type of plot, that the, the blue dots are coming from simulations and the red dots and the and green dots are coming from, from observational measurements, from in-situ measurements. And well, in some cases, you, you have your, your domain completely filled up and well, methods are performing, you know, GPs or joint GPs are performing pretty, pretty, pretty equally. Uh, but what happens when you have these cases, um, in, like in Greece, where there is like a big mismatch and not all the expected distribution, theoretical distribution in blue is, is completely for that. So what happens in those cases is that the confidence intervals are they increased quite a lot. And then also we can take that as a kind of like extrapolation indicator. And it is also nice because you also learn from the GP a, a, a parameter that tells you, Hey, in this case, you should not trust your institute. Right? And this was actually after a lot of discussions with the group things that uh, we were able to, to certify that there were like some mismatch and different uh, you know, protocols that they were not open in this measurement uh, campaign. So it, it could learn something, right? Okay, there is another way to incorporate physics in machine learning. Uh, and in this case, again, with Russian processes, we try to incorporate all these ordinary differential equations. Most of the times in physics, we are working with differential equations, either uh, ordinary or partial. But this is a, a, a very nice Russian process uh, that uh, essentially looks and resembles sort of a, a neural network you can see in the, in the cartoon on the left. But essentially here, the inputs the input nodes, they are not actually observed. They are modeled as Gaussian process trials, and then you have a, a number of, 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 <coughs> of latent forces, let's call them, which are latent forces. This is a parameter for two. And then what you assume is that the combination of these latent forces, the linear combination, are passed through a linear filter, this H process, well, as some additive rise that Gaussian noise will give rise to your observational data. Okay. And then what you learn are is many things. I mean, you learn the leading portion, you learn the parameters, you learn the upper parameters for the noise, you learn many different things. Why is this useful? Well, this is useful, for example, in this case. In this case, we were interested in predicting moisture, soil moisture. Okay, coming from different sensors, from different satellite sensors. And every sensor is measuring differently, right? You have also different uh, temporal scales, different revisiting time. So the, you have like a very big problem of uneven sampling. And then what happens here is that uh, these are the in-situ measurements in that particular station. You have here predictions and also the uh, small data. This is a one satellite sensor, ASCAP sensor, and the answer too, that you can actually see that in the early two years, you, you, know, you didn't have that sensor. It was not existing, it was not flying. But the model is able to extrapolate and to you know, transport the information from these sensors to this other and give you, of course, all the advantages of, of GPs. Not only the, the, the good predictions in this case, but also the confidence center, right? But moreover, I mean, when you look uh, and zoom in in some particular in some particular pieces of the country, this latent force model is actually performing quite well. But what about the latent forces that the, this model has learned? Well, uh, remember that the the, the this, this latent force model GP is not is only using time as input. Okay, nothing nothing like that. Other than that. So when you look at this, when you look at this latent force that has been learned, you immediately recognize this, that it has learned something related to precipitation, which is quite intriguing because the model never saw precipitation as important, but it is learning that precipitation is actually a driving force of soil moisture. Of course, if it rains, the soil is wet, right? And this was the basic relation that we were encoding in this filter that I told you about. Um, these H filters. These H filters are basically derived from the first order ODE relating the decay uh, in soil moisture as the as a as, uh, taking a precipitation, let's say, or a spike as, a, as an input point of the, of the precipitation. 
Okay, so that was nice because people were learning some kind of writing factor. I mean, you could, for example, learn principal friction factor yeah, by looking how we wet the soil. Yeah. Kind of not exactly, but really close to causality. Yeah. Then the fourth paradigm, I would say, is uh, hybrid modeling, we call it. I mean, hybrid modeling, this is a, a new term, but it is actually a very old stuff. Uh, you can see this paper in, in 2004 with the authors in this in this role of computer science chemical engineering, they were interested in, in, in monitoring some particular parameters of our chemical crew cell. Um, and I'm not really an expert on those, on those things, but it was really you know striking to me <coughs> that that figure in the paper that this is what act, we are actually interested in now these days. Oh, makes sense like hybrid models, right? Because you have a network and then you have some other ancillary variables that are coming from a physical process and they combine everything. No? And then I was really, really curious about what happened with this sort of literature. There were only two papers. And then I discovered that they that this disappeared I and mean, this vanished in the, in the big literature uh, body of, of the literature, mainly because at that time you don't have automatic differentiation. So you could not learn these two models at the same time, end to end. So you have to pick one, then fed it to the other one, and then alternate, uh, alternate between them. And that, of course, it is not practical. Right? And, and, and then this brings us to propose like uh, a big family of methodologies for, for hybridizing, if you want, to the, the definition. Um, and this is the idea. The idea is, it is it's very simple, is to design um, layers in our networks that you know incorporate some constraints that should be reasonable and should be a certifiable interesting, right? For example, you have this very nice uh, example um, in, in the, on the right. Uh, in here, the author used an encoder color architecture in order to predict motion fields. And then, thanks to the use of a statistical model, they could actually work these motion field predictions in such a way that they should be physically consistent. And then you can learn end to end analysis. Right? So that was a very, very, very nice uh, exercise, a very nice example of this hybrid uh, model uh, uh, paradigm. Yeah, more, and you can you can tell from the literature that in physics we are always working with different equations, and this is another standard approach in hybrid modeling, which is called uh, physics informed neural networks. Essentially, here instead of just developing a neural network or predicting S I R, what you know is that there are some intrinsic relationship relationships uh, between S I R, uh, basically driven by some differential equations that you know, or even some conservation laws like this E4, right? In E4, they're basically uh, trying to, to balance some, some or to keep under control uh, an energy balance, right? Or, or a mass balance, for example. Right? And then what it designs is that you can design this architecture and the, the relationship between the differential equations and the, and the implemented operator, uh, they, they can be cast as a, as a neural network. That's well, a couple neural network, right? So what happens with this neural network in the end? So well, you get your SIR uh, predictions as well, but you can also learn hyperparameters of the different approach, which are really cool because you could say something about the alphas and the betas, so you could be more let's say consistent and objective uh, by learning the, those hyperparameters and parameters of the LDEs uh, through this. Okay? So that's a uh, very, very nice example of the year. Of course, I told you, okay, yeah, we have this problem that models are complicated, they are costly most of the times. So there is this field of emulation of surrogate modeling that tries to you know, replace a physical model with machine learning, which is a simple, nice, and neat preparation exercise. So you generate data from your model, and then you have X and Y, and then you play this mapping with a machine learning. What do you gain by that? Of course, speed, because then once the, the neural network or the GP is trained, then you can start predicting like crazy and getting like a lot of uh, a lot of simulations 
almost like yeah for free and very very cheap you know? but then you also included some uh, some properties let's say of the machine learning model that you are being used for example if you are using a Gaussian process you could derive confidence intervals for the, for the simulation something that you could not do with your your in principle with your um with your uh, physical model unless of course you do some fragmentation analysis or and then at the same time, you can learn something about the, what are the important parameters in the physical rules as well, because you can run this sensitive analysis and you can make the confidence of the code. Okay, and then the last example, just before the, just the coffee break, um, is about discovering equations from data. And this is a very simple, very neat example of how you can do this under certain circumstances. Okay. So authors here put in the problem as a regression problem, as a sparse regression problem. So imagine that you have this uh, very nice and simple, uh, let's say, uh, Lawrence tractor, X, Y, Z, uh, and then you can uh, basically, yeah, improve it or yeah, discretize the derivatives. So you have uh, the derivatives of X, of Y, and Z, and then you construct your basis let's say, with uh, yeah, your design matrix, if you want, your phi of x, as all the possible or classical combinations of x, y, z. Then you can compute that, right? You can do the uh, one, or in the bias, the x, the y, the z, the x squared, the y squared, x times y, x times z, whatever, right? So you build this phi, and then you learn this sparse way to, for example, last one, okay? So that's what we proposed, and it actually kind of recovered the effect of very well. And this works decently well, well, very, very well in low noise regimes. But at the moment that you incorporate some stochasticity, then the, then the model is actually failing and is very sensitive to this. We were super interested in applying this in, in our sciences because some processes are known and you want to know. You, you want to know not only these coefficients of the of learning the dynamics of particular ecosystems in this case, but also remember as soon as you have a differential equation, you can start uh, asking questions, right? You can start doing perturbation analysis and you can you can say things about stability or chaoticity or projections, etc. Et right? So in this case, we collected a good bunch of, of, of data, uh, temperature, GDP, um, moisture many different variables right many different variables and then we were able to compress them in two main axes just for, for you know for integrating the, the, the system and it was very nice because with just three components we could we could summarize the status of this of this ecosystems at our 90 something percent of the variance in this case just for simplicity we plot only the first two axes and for different ecosystems you can see here uh, let's say my same continental ecosystems, etc. And these are basically the trajectories, and these are the equations that you are that you are able to learn. And then you can start uh, analyzing the, the, the way. Of course, this is super preliminary results, and we have to scrutinize more the the, the ground estimates. Okay, so I hope there are questions. I told you a good bunch of stories. So we have like yeah, some more like 10 minutes or something here to discuss. Uh, or yeah, we have to take a couple. <laughs> so I have a question precisely uh, about the last slides you were you were showing, so maybe it's just on point. But um, so first, what's the difference between this discover or the EPDs that you're presenting as a six point? And the one that I think you were presenting earlier in terms of hybrid modeling that was using the physics informed neural networks in which you can also learn the, the parameters of the of, of PD. So that this and also I think one of the points of the that, that was sold, I mean I, I never use those models, so maybe there's something I, I don't know, but one of the points that was sold on those physics informed neural network used to discover the PDEs is that thanks to uh, automatic differentiation, they didn't need 
to compute the derivatives by finite differences. And so they were much more robust to noise. So I was wondering if this is something you had explored also in this, in this context. Well, the, the, yeah, the two questions, right? Yeah. The difference is very subtle. Here, you're uh, seeing a big uh, design matrix. I will call the possible relationships because you, you are uncertain about what are we doing with perfect relationships. It is very subtle because, on the other case, and hence you, you are assuming the right equations that you want to learn, right? and you are more interested in the parameter information. Okay. But it is very, 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 very subtle. Then the, so the second question was the, uh, the noise, right? Yeah, yeah so, so I think yeah there is so there is a, a connection but uh, I was actually seated in the, in the PhD theory of, of somebody who has done his PhD thesis on, on this which is my only knowledge on, on this but they were precisely combining the two the sparse regression with the pins approach mm -hmm. um, so so they were so they were both discovering which of the terms they should keep in the P and the, the value of the coefficients. So maybe I'm not sure it scales. I'm not sure it's, uh, but it feels like it's a connection between the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably there's a connection. I mean, I, I think that the connection is is uh, can be traced uh, because essentially here, um, I mean, in the end here, you are using a lasso, you're using a, a linear regression, uh, but the the basis is not linear. In the other case, you have the differential equations that you're uh, they are explicitly. Uh, Good at basis, right? Because in the end, uh, let me see. Uh, here. Here, here, here. Oops. Yeah. Here, this would be the alphas and the betas corresponding to the ways that you're learning with BASO, let's say, with the CD approach, with the second approach. Uh, well, yeah, here you're already computing finite differences, so yeah, in order to be doing the so the connections is, I think it's uh, because of these two issues. No? The only thing is that here you are, in my opinion, uh, you are, are completely um, certain that these are the equations to, that you learn. And while in the other case, uh, well, of course, you can do like basic problem or whatever, or maybe consider only some of them, but the, the solution is more ample. Um, simpler in the case, in, in a way, because it is just a lasso regression. Um, but simply, I don't have it to explain this thing. So, uh, yeah. <coughs> what I can tell you from the noise is that, uh, at least for this case, in this case, it is very, very, very sensitive. And then it's And the selection of the base. Oh, wow. In real cases, I mean. Yes. 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 We have been playing around with different Russian processes uh, for 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 both for coupling I mean for, for tackling the nonlinearity issue and also because we in Russian processes the derivatives can be expressed as 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 well. And then um, it is more amenable to do the same. But still very sensitive. Yeah, yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah. The only thing is that you you're in the in the previous, I mean in the constraint optimization approach, um you would be learning a standard a network and you would be Parameters in the, in, the middle, in the connection layer, right? Here, everything is coupled when you learn the coupled parameters. Oh, no, no point. Uh, so, I had a question about the, the, the real life model with the age and everything, you know, the super processing guy, I love it. Uh, and so, basically, you learn. Uh, you do source separation, but you simultaneously learn the source. So, uh, the one I said, yeah, here, but you simultaneously learn the source that are the X. Yeah. And uh, also with the physical 
convolution. Yes. Non stationary convolution with the edge. That, that's what I said. Yes, yes, because I mean, this is just a cartoon, this is just a design. But what, what happens is that note that the model with the latent forces are decreased and all the operations are linear operations and linear filters in the end is a GP. Mm -hmm. So it has an associated kernel. So you can, I mean, after, you know, a uh, very nice sunny afternoon to add uh, a glass of wine and integrate it in twice, <laughs> slowly, by parts and all that stuff, you can come up with the equation that you have to, I mean, with the kernel that you have to optimize. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, very beautiful. Method. Yeah. I think we both are buying a week to Alvarez and and Levi's and so on. We have been exploring this. Well, that's a very challenging question. I mean, the question was about the, the, uh, what are the what is the status now on the machine learning uh, real application? What can we predict and what, what can we not predict? And, and it is a very, very, very multimedia question because it depends on the application itself. I mean, and, and the, the sensors that you want. So it's keyboard work in the hospital only, and then you have the problems of clouds, because then you have to station uh, and then you have the problems of yeah, feeling basically you know? and then in the arena for example gans and normalized both have been have been used in that in this review including from along the 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 scattering approaches also in colors and housing colors have been used in order to you know be able to think patient as well also for detecting anomalies it is complicated to say, okay, we are fine, or yeah, there are lots of challenges because the field is evolving so fast, and it is also depending a lot, a lot, a lot on the application and the spatial and the temporal resolution that you have uh, that plays a role. Um, there's also some, some, you know, a lot of applications of machine learning and only for instances data only, right, and learning about those. People working on a global scale, you know, you have to go to the force of spatial resolution. Uh, then, yeah, but then you encounter the problem of, of sampling because you only have a uh, measuring station in the each lot, let's say, right? And then what happens and when you try to, to extrapolate to, to the south, right? Or to the tropics where the GDP is. So, so there are like many problems of sampling problems and many, many challenges of, of extrapolation because you don't actually know where when and where are the extrapolation when you derive the geospo group and maps from data. So that's why still we have, I see a lot of let's say reluctancy or yeah, skepticism from the physics uh, people um from machine learning because I mean data even if not if you have access to many of them data points is not enough it's not enough okay. um, yeah the validation strategies is a couple of parameters in and there's a different situation there has been some some recent uh, efforts uh, from some advantage some advantage um uh, and not to speak about why that's another story you know because I, as i told you earlier the the system is evolving and it's ever changing so and this is a yeah the big failure of machine learning, right? We are not really prepared to work with a petabyte of data in a constantly evolving system in space and time, right? So full of anomalies. Yeah. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, but then we have an episode. 
So let's go for, for this part three, the last one, uh, with this uh, yeah, fine tuned level of models that are transparent, as transparent as possible, are uh, interpretable in one, explainable, um, and causal. Um, yeah, particularly interesting in those. Let's see what happens here. No? So let's jump here first for the explainable AI field. Uh, probably we have already heard about this field in, in machine learning and in deep learning in particular, because we can see we can really see that the, the main developments are that yeah, there are some, a lot of developments in deep learning, and most of them they end up with a big monster over parameterized with millions and millions of weights to them. That fits very well and that is amazingly well, right? So you would say, okay. And what are these weights for, right? I mean, it is like, so what, what the hell are you doing with those? No? So, this is mainly the, the, the field of interpreting what the model is trying to learn, right? The interpretability is an issue. And we want to, to discover what are the, the intrinsic rules or the tricks and hacks, uh, uh, the tools that the, the machine learning is actually taking. No? So, uh, there are many different approaches to this problem, but in the end, the main objective is to try to either explain what's happening between the input and the output, or opening the box and looking inside. Right? You have this sort of opportunity. Um, I, I name it this as deconstruction. So you want to, you know, make pieces out of the, the, the big piece, no? And it is not. I mean, it is a big field, actually. <laughs> it is not just that we are starting with that. Uh, there are like probably 10 to 20 pages <coughs> of 20 or 100 pages each with 500 references each. It's kind of, by the way, I didn't check that back today. So probably there's another one. So it's quite, um, you know, yeah, challenging. Right, to keep up with the field, but I would say that there are basically, in a very simplistic way of approaching the field, you have like two, three different forms. You can either um, construct a self explanatory model, or you can try to open the box and try to see what are the filters doing, or you can replace this very complicated model with something simpler, but it is more amenable, right? There are many, this, this is what they do. Or you can just resort to standard ways in statistics and interest as always and derive sensitivity maps of the input output map. So these are basically the, the main strategies in the field, but there are many others. Okay? So let's start with simple examples in the earth system side. Okay? So the first approach was the sensitivity analysis that happened like two decades ago or three or even three decades ago. Mm -hmm. Different, different flavors, but essentially here the objective is to derive a ranking, right? A, a relative relevance feature ranking, and this is the standard approach. Uh, you don't care too much about what's happening inside the model, but you just want to, to summarize 
what happens when I perturbate one input and see what happens with the output. I mean, if I perturbate it and the output changes, is that if it, if, if this input is actually important, right? Or if I I mean the it, no? Or if I just put everything to zero. I mean, you start disturbing the inputs and see what happens with them, right? This is a standard approach. Uh, and that was very nice. I mean, this is still very useful because it works for whatever machine you want. So it is not model specific. You can apply it to a network, to the forest, to whatever. No? Uh, in, in recent years, we came up with this uh, analysis in, in this plus one paper. Uh, for some kernel methods, because we all see that most of the times you only want to refer to derivatives of each problem or depression to explain what's happening, what's happening in a model, right? And what is nice of kernel methods that you, is that you can actually uh, derive those in explicit form. And they only depend on the kernel function because the weights of the particular function, they are fixed already because they are learned. And we apply not only to regression, Regression processes, but also SPMs, they play a role and they can be related to the margin. Then you can also uh, apply to density estimation with kernel and copy, and copy component analysis. So there's also a connection between the derivative and the reach uh, with, the, with the information content of the data distribution and then the estimation. And then we also jump into applying these techniques to explain dependency. And we apply it to this uh, kernel method for measure for the number of measures that I told you for eight, right? So you can actually derive uh, maps of sensitivity of a dependent measure. And, and you could use that, for example, for maximizing dependency or minimizing dependency. Um, and we apply it to, for, for example, for detecting anomalies, anomalies in temperature. So when the derivative is changing a lot in space of time, is because something anomalous is changing. It is happening. Right? So you can summarize these different measures in time and, and identify what is actually changing. In a very similar fashion to, to, to this video that I showed you at the very beginning. Right? Okay, uh, but what happens when you have like unsupervised models? For example, you have a density simulator. Uh, how do you analyze those? Because you don't, you don't actually have like a, you know, basic mapping x to y, right? So this is the case of this encoder the cover uh, model that we developed for for detecting anomalies. In particular, we focus on the regression feedback that I showed you. So the the algorithm is basically um, deriving like a later representation with an encoder the cover strategy. Uh, the encoder is a particular instantiation of, uh, of fast and slow neural networks that, because you have different samplings in the different variables that you're ingesting. Remember, we are ingesting cubes of moisture, GPT, transpiration, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there are gaps as well. So you want to incorporate all this spatial temporal information in the code. So the, it is basically taking a uh, paying attention to the different aspects of these cubes uh, in space by attention mechanisms and the appearance uh, features factors and emotion because you are dealing with uh, different uh, different kinds of processes happening at different times. And then what happens? You learn to how to reconstruct these cubes well with this specific encoder. Then you learn a later representation, and then what? Well, we want to derive uh, an anomaly score out of this later representation. So what we did is computing an anomaly score after uh, Gaussianizing with a Gaussian mistaken flow. So you can multivariate Gaussianize this distribution, and then it is very simple to derive the score from the <coughs> probability that you are able to make. The, the point is that if this method works very, very well. Very well. Uh, you can see here in the curve. That the Russian figure is, or at least the onset is actually very, very well captured. There are, of course, of course, some false alarms here and there, but they were not only interested in detecting this drop that is can be uh, reasonably detected, it is a very massive and quite evident um, uh, heat wave impacting the area, but we wanted to, to understand what the model has learned, what are the features and the and, and the, the temporal case that are important for the test, or anticipated. 
and, and this is what happens, right? So uh, we could derive a uh, sensitivity analysis out of the encoder by just applying integrated gradients. This is a technique typically used in explaining the AI. So uh, account for the derivatives of the, of, the, of the function. And then what you can do is to derive this sort of maps that tell you which are the variables that are more active and more important to find. Okay? And then of course you can transpose this in, in, in So what is nice is that for example, here around, around the, 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 the time of the, of the event, Essentially, the user index they were suffering right after the, the event. Then, air temperature was was popping up, of course, and then uh, lower uh, decrease in evaporation of uh, the GDP. And, and then, what it was of interest is what happened before, just in case that we can anticipate it, and what happens after, what have the impacts, what are the kind of impacts of this trial. And then, you can monitor this according to what the model observed. It is an important, an important uh, advantage of trying to, to explain what the model has learned to learn from the past and then turn into the solution. Well, the second approach is very simple. It is just to decompose your model. Well, if you cannot, uh, if you're, of course, you, you, you can work with uh, the Gaussian processes, it is very easy because you only, you know, that the Gaussian processes, as in any metrics, everything boils down to the design of our thermal function. And in this case, uh, we were very interested in predicting crop yields in the, in the, in the corn belt in the US. Here, where, well, uh, there's a very massive uh, region where you have corn, of course, and wheat and soybean. And you want to estimate the protection year wise for every county. Okay? So we were ingesting all kinds of variables. Vegetation indices, time series, vegetation of people that soil moisture, all kinds of meteorological variables, etc. And then we wanted to, to, to estimate this couple, right? Um, but there are like non-stationarities and non-linearities and different non-sources in this process. Every county is measuring in different ways. Uh, there are some missing gaps here and there. There are the, some trends because of the uh, yeah, because of particular because of irrigation strategies or or, or, yeah, or different agricultural uh, or practices. So we wanted to design a very simple and neat uh, function like this one. So we basically used a combination of three curve functions, a linear one, an RBS one, and a noise term. So you can learn what is the relative relevance of the linearity that seems to account for non-stationarities and the non-linear with a new. Then you can learn a sigma parameter for the scales, and then you can learn the sigma n for the noise, how much noise we have per account. Okay. And then what is nice is that okay, you can do a good job, you can predict y1 with, 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 uh, with crops, uh, but then you can also explain, right? Because when you predict and you can visualize with, uh, the differences between the predictions and your and your and the optimism of data, you can tell, for example, that the uh, there are like big differences between the maximum and the typical uh, gradients. Also, some deviations or some shifts in the vegetation of the left. This variable is accounting for, let's say, roughly speaking, how much water the, the, the plants are accumulating, okay, for growth. So you can you can tell some differences in when actually happen. Okay, so you can anticipate some <coughs> yeah problems in the in the growth status of the vegetation. Uh, so moisture, and then what, what is also nice is that then just by looking at the model weights, the, the parameters of the model, uh, that gives you kind of an idea of what are the most anomalous or most erroneous uh, predictions, right? And this actually happened over here, and this corresponds to a particular country that was very, very affected, at least uh, the hazards were very affected by uh, the year droughts in that, in that year. So this is simple model. But, but by construction, we can actually explain what's going on. Okay, there is this third family called model distillation. I'm sorry, but I don't have any example in this. Uh, probably there's some, but uh, I didn't find it. And I think that this is a very promising direction, by the way. Uh, essentially, the idea is okay, I have this big monster. 
the big five neural network that I don't want, uh, but I have to, right? Uh, and then I want to replace it with something simpler and more scalable. So people have been ideating how to, you know, sparsify these models, simplify them, approximating when to run them for it, but this should be something simple that, okay, give us some, some accuracy, but at least we can do that for this one. So essentially, it works in a very similar fashion to Saturday modeling or emulator, right? But instead of emulating a physical model, you have a uh, uh, <coughs> Okay, and the, and the fourth approach is opening the box and looking at it inside, you know? So, yeah, th this is old stuff in computer vision because people were interested in learning what or understanding what are the different the computers doing in a convolution on network. And they discovered that while well, the first layers are possibly more edges, the second ones are are, are, are more. And, uh, unless you go for uh, let's say deeper and deeper layers, you are getting like more semantic and compositional aspects. But it is yeah uh, uncertain as well, right? And there is a big discussion going on. Um, here, there's this method uh, called uh, regression active modeling, uh, where basically after ingesting and, and putting all the layers that you you might have you, know, you have a recursion layer in the end of all the layers that basically is, is spinning down and weighing down the different aspects of the of the of the variables and the layers you know? so you can actually visualize what's happening on, what's happening uh, through through time yeah. we were again interested in predicting uh, crop yield in this particular case it was quick media and it was very impressive because you could actually write this sort of maps telling you again which are the variations of the different components, the different variables, the different variables, uh, through time, and which were more or less affected by uh, by crowds or by by yeah, by floods in particular. Um, again, monitoring and learning and anticipation for for education, for testing. There's a basically the main, the main application that we may find in the remote as a Good. This is super cool, no? Because we can <laughs> almost there, we are almost there. No, we can explain almost everything, right? We can encode, encode the physics, decode physics, right? And then we can also uh yeah, explain what's going on in fact, no? Uh, well, not quite yet. No, why? Because yeah, there's something that happened a year, like one hundred years ago. It was unfortunate, and now uh, it was, you know, decentralization, right? Decentralization flooded the field statistics and machine learning. Statistical interest in general was the year, and you cannot even pronounce the C word. You no, know? this is how the name is how it it's almost a little, right? You can say you have to say well, something associated with drives, you know, impacts that, right? You cannot even take cost based on that, right? Let's see what is going on now in the field of, let's say, pragmatic causality. I'm not going to practice on theoretical causality, uh, this is not my field, and I know almost nothing about that, but we try to develop couple inference methods that can be applied in the uh in, in under certain circumstances and of course under uh some assumptions uh, to our field of right now. So yeah um sort of a motivation right formulation is not causation but then what 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 is what's happening no? is no correlation what is it what is it no, you, you have this this stupid example right uh, that correlates the, the Chocolate consumption has been modeled by the power of people, right? And it is almost linear. So, so you only have to feed your population with chocolate, right? That's good. I mean, yeah, it would be good in a way. Or this other example that this author they just uh, published his paper with a uh, yeah, striking uh, relationship between between stores, uh, appearance and uh, and babies in Britain. It's not a particular region in, in Germany. And they come down and was wow, the stories are, are bringing babies. Yeah, I mean, everyone could agree on that, right? It's just an empirical observation. That's good, no? But maybe it is not stories that are bringing babies or that Britain babies are like attracting storks. 
maybe it happened. Uh, maybe it is something else. Maybe the second founder, like for example, rule of area that are possible, right? Like start and people are no big, yeah, because of whatever reason. Okay, so trying to go a little bit more formal, more formalized, you could have like Given these two variables, like storage and data, you can basically think of three situations, right? The, yeah, <clears throat> the two unlikely ones that storage are constant babies, or the yeah, babies are tracking storage. Or you can think of these z variables uh, that uh, is actually possible driving this, okay? Um, well, in the end, everything resorts to the computation and the analysis of, of this joint distribution. And you can actually summarize it or yeah, uh, analyze it in different ways, depending on the factorization you choose, right? You could choose this or the other one. And then both are actually correct. So which one is the right one, right? So this is the, okay. So this is known as the common cost principle. It says that basically x and y are statistically dependent. Then there is exist there exists a z variable that is actually possible. And this is an important concept, right? By right, 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 right. Uh, yeah, like uh, fifty-six, I think. Um, it was a very important uh, principle that. Uh, Basically, set up the, the basis of, of modern company. And now it is kind of possible under certain circumstances and assumptions uh, to develop methods that can be uh, worried about this population. Why is it important? Well, it, causal discovery or causal inference is really, really important because it allows you to learn not only that X is good for picking Y, but if X is actually fucking Y, or it is the other way around, I mean, you have your, your, your emulator arbitration problem, and then you inverse X and Y, maybe you can get it quite well. So, what well, can we actually do? So, what is good for? I mean, cost of discovery or cost of inference is good for many different things, especially in the Earth side, system side. For hypothesis testing, we are always doing assumptions. This can drive that. Maybe the arena event is driving moisture in this area, or temperature rises because of that. So we can check this with observations and algorithms. Uh, also, for comparing models and data, right? Because uh, I've seen before that our data and our simulations are either very scarce or very massive. And in any case, they have some kind of structures to think about like when comparing these. They are very unevenly sampled cubes. It is really, really hard, right? Even with modern statistical techniques, no, that try to you know find a kind of a manifold embedding or the back and whatever. It is really hard to compare them. So comparing them to the development of causal of causal graphs, that could be that could be a good a good approach. And then the, the third thing, the third, let's say, very factual and very useful uh, question that we could address with cost of discovery would be trying to discover what are, what are the causes of extreme impacts or extreme events. You know? uh, for example, well, two days ago, we were suffering from you know, a severe heat wave, and actually, I uh, talked to my people in Valencia, they were something like they were two to 40 degrees, something like that. What is going on? I mean, is this just because of this iron uh, battery that is coming up, or it is just probably used by climate change or not? So, can we actually discern or attribute the causes, the real causes of, of the events that we observe? Okay, so there is a bunch of methods, and uh, <coughs> with some colleagues, we published these two papers um, showing you here on the slide. Um, the first one is uh, about the characterization of the time series in the future. Sciences. It is important to note here that we are in this particular paper, the first one, we are focusing only on time series. Okay. On the second one, we are um, um, approaching the field of what happens when you don't have time involved. It is a bit complicated, no? Because everything that uh, has been always argued that time is the only um, substrate of causation, right? What happens when you don't have uh, time involved in the, in the process because you want to start? So there are kind of methods for, for tracking this problem. So 
here you will see that there are four different uh, methodologies that can be applied. I will go through them uh, just with a pragmatic example of each one of them so you can more like a more wonderful guy to the other uh, This time we want to explain Jacobson. It's a very long method. Uh, yeah, awarded to the stranger. Um, uh, he, he was awarded with Nobel Prize in economics in 55, I think, or 52. I think it's a method. Um, but uh, this is a very, very intuitive method. And while people have argued that this is not actually causality, it's more about predictability, right? So if you have X and Y and you are able to predict Y from the past of Y uh, better than, the, than from the past of X and Y, it's because uh, there is no causality between. Right? And if you can do it the other way around, maybe you can, you can argue that there is some kind of great causality. Right? Um, I said great causality, and I cannot say causality because it is too much. Good myself, uh, this is the kind of caliber in the world, right? So you have to speak properly, and this is like range of okay. So there are other methods called non linear methods. Um, and, and I will show you an example of it again. It is for um, delegated enough that you feel so far, you know, it's a split based on methodology <laughs> and, and the factor uh, modeling. And you will see in a second. Of course, the third. Approach has to do with this uh, motivation that I show you about the source and the babies, about how to factorize it to EDF and how to actually estimate conditional independence, uh, how to do that properly and efficiently, and what happens when you have time to solve it. Right? And the fourth one is, is related to structural copper models. I uh, will show you a very, very simple one uh, that we actually uh, evolved in, the, in this second paper. Okay, let's go on. Um, the first approach, the standard range causality. So you have a same series, well, a couple of same series, so many same series, right? So you have x, y, z, one, z, two, whatever. And then the idea here is just to develop two models. So you predict the, the, the future of y from the past of x, or you predict the future of y from the past of x and the past of y. Okay, and then you just check the decision who is performing better. That's it. Super simple, neat, free, right? But then this methodology suffered from two main big assumptions, I would say, you know, stationarity and uh, yeah, linearity. Right? So, what we proposed recently was a, a method based on sort of methods and expertise that can cope with those no stationary processes that are often occurring in the universities of science and the yeah and the and the on the end, obviously because of the of the nature of kind of math you know? and but the approach was very similar right it is we call it the explicit range of causality or cross information okay. so here I will exemplify this in a very um what is it clear example of why Correlation is not a least stringent position, right? So, so look, um, here we are interested in analyzing the relationship between what, what are the impacts of a linear event and that happens in, in around in this area in the Pacific Ocean, and what is the impact of the uh, soil moisture on on land? Is it actually impacting or not? Uh, what measure? Right? So here you have on the on the left hand side you have this map showing you the yeah, the correlation, the time lag correlation between uh, the linear time series and the soil moisture time series. So you can compute. Okay. Can compute when are when, when is the you know, the maximum time lag correlation? And there, there, then you can find like many different great regions that are actually impacted positively or negatively because of the the mean, right? Yeah, okay, it's fine. Uh, but then what happens when you apply this nonlinear range of causality, or even with the range of causality, a lot of a lot of detections are actually identified as spurious. They are not really uh, per, uh, useful for prediction. So they are not really useful for assessing the <laughs> range of causality. Right? And this is what happens. Only the, the green dots are the, the green circles are the only ones that are actually uh, range proper. And the red ones are not really very the they are just the previous evolution. 
So as a conclusion, I would say that causality is uh, yeah, a sharper indicator of, uh, of the of mechanical correlation. And uh, in this case, we could only retain um, like the real frame causes of soil moisture in very dry and extreme ecosystems, where it's very wet, just like in the tropics. Okay? And where they were the only two seasons. And the other thing was we were not contested. We would say something. Okay. Then another approach, also for plant series. Okay, so here the idea is uh, is uh, interesting and it has been applied uh, badly in many many different uh, situations. This is called convergent cross mapping. So essentially, CCM um, develops or approximates the manifold of X, manifold of Y. And tries to answer the question if there is some kind of information footprint effects on Y or any point of on Y. I mean, it, it does a lot of regressions, local regressions from the nearby points in X close to the Y point and the other way around. And this is done with an increasing amount of data around the locality of the, of the submanifold that we are trying to explain. And then the argument is that with more data, the conversion. That's why the convergence here appears. The convergence is still kept. I mean, the difference between the correlation and going one direction or the other is still kept, is because the information of X is actually impacting the Y. So there is some good information footprint of Y, so you can actually claim that Y is, is caused by that. So this is a good method, but again, strong assumption, as I said. The first one, clear, a strong assumption is that. Um, you only need two variables. Yeah. You only have two, two manifolds, you only need two variables. Now, this is quite disturbing, right? Because, yeah, what happens with the Z variables, no? In fact, in storks and, and, uh, and they use them. So, well, you have to assume that there are, you can actually recover the manifold structure from uh, private differences and from uh, only one variable, and the relationships are only. Um, the second big assumption, or yeah, I would say, caveat of this method is that it is very sensitive to noise. It has like a lot of hyperparameters to clean. And what we did in that in that particular paper was to yeah to address some of these issues essentially by connecting the dots, connecting this method with an information geometric criteria. criteria. Um, we connected those and then also in order to get rid of this you know sensitivity to noise we apply the, the methodology with a good start you know, resampling technique that could alleviate more like the, yeah, the, the instabilities of the method we apply it to again global cubes and in this case we could learn some relationships between proper synthesis uh, temperature and moisture and we could derive causal maps right we could say Okay, in this particular region of the very dry or what or limited regions, uh, the dark the, the, the cross dry productivity and the synthetic activity of plant and vegetation is being caused by moisture or at least limited by moisture. Uh, temperature is only important or causing uh, uh, impacts in the boreal regions in those variables, and the GPP is affected by the moisture in this particular region, like the savannas or. Uh, you could say something like this. Of course, there is always, you know, the fear that you cannot actually validate that, other than looking at and, and, and talking to the experts and saying, okay, this looks like a reasonable pattern. Maybe this this is not that right because maybe there is another variable, another confounder that you do not you did not incorporate in the in your, in your pipeline, and you should. This kind of thing. Okay. And then the third approach we have to do with you know with the with the estimation of condition in the time. So you only want to, to check if x is causing y, y is causing x, you then z. Right? Uh, a very simple approach that was presented uh, some years ago, um, and essentially it relies in this case on, on linear uh, regression. So you only have to assume two linear models. So you look at it x from z, y from z, and then check if the if the residuals are correlated or not. 
And that's it. Super, super smart, super easy. A very simple condition in the standard set. Very simple. Uh, what happens? Of course, you can like this. Okay, what is linearity? Huh? And so, what, what can we do? Can you, you have uh, this nonlinear shape, shape dynamic distribution. I mean, this is just 2D, no? but you may imagine what happens when you get this dimension. So, uh, an approximation or an alternative okay, is, of course, using nonlinear method, according to the dimension. So, you learn X from Gaussian classes with me, uh, Y from me. With another GP, and then you get the independence of the receiver, likewise. Um, in this case, we also say use the distance correlation coefficient that it is costly, and it uh, has some parameters, QT parameters for good. And uh, yeah, when you replace this distance correlation coefficient with this, it becomes a bit more stable, not super stable, but stable. And people have been using this. In schemes called PC. The PC scheme is an efficient way to browse and to analyze a holograph of, of many different variables to identify which are the kind of It's very efficient because you can see that uh, the number of variables increases, the drive increases, and the amount of combinations is exploded. exploded. So here in, in, in the PC algorithms, we can actually. Um, there is a method called PCMCI that has essentially attacks like this condition on instant time usage. Okay, so the trick of potentially instant time usage. Uh, uh, and this method, PCMCI, has been quite used in the community, uh, both in earth sciences and, and, and climate sciences. And in this case, people use that, I mean, our colleagues here in Germany, they use them for comparing. Um, models with observation in this case. So you know that you have climate simulations coming from different models, and then you have the observational world. And then instead of comparing with cubes, you want to derive a causal graph here, uh, climate simulation or observation. Uh, and then you have like you, you end up with a causal graph here, and then you compare the action. Are these people matching or not between the models across the model? Or between each model and the observation. So you can say something about yeah, what is what are the most plausible models in the when, when it comes to comparison to causally, not just in terms of correlation or information. <coughs> okay, and then just to end up, um, the fourth family is called structural causal models, uh, comes back again to this question of. How do we factorize these joints? Mm -hmm. And the, the idea is very, very simple. I, mean, I like it very much, <laughs> uh, to be honest. It has to, it has to do with this, with this um, idea that the cause should be actually independent of the mechanism that it is passing, or the, me the, the generating mechanism, I mean, the, the function that is passing x to y. Okay? So if we assume in this, what that x is the cause, and you have a you know a generating mechanism of y, then it becomes really pretty clear that this funky distribution of y could not actually derive a cause the distribution of x. It is more plausible the other way around, right? So here the idea or the motivation is to assess the independence of uh, I mean, the independence of the generating mechanism, right? independence of this one. Okay? So, how do you approach this in a very, very neat and simple way? So, this is a, a, a classical motivational example. So, you have the altitude of, of a bunch of cities in the world and, and, the, and the temperature, and their temperature, right? So, it is obvious because of physical laws and because of uh, your common sense, if you want, that. Altitude is causing temperature. I mean, it will be absurd no? to think that the temperature of the cities is causing the hot, no? Maybe yes, they are on top of a volcano or something. I don't know. But anyway, so what they do is, is essentially to fit two models to predict temperature from altitude and a prediction temperature. Probably the accuracy will be pretty much the same. 
Um, and then what you do, the second step is you have to plot the residuals and check if the residuals of the forward or the backward model are more or less independent of the potential cost. In this case, on the left, you have the temperature residuals compared to the altitude, and then on the right, you have the altitude residual compared to the temperature. And you can see that here on the right, you have you basically just by naked eye, you see more structure. So there's more dependence here, no? So you have you're 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 missing something. You're missing something. There's a structure in the residuals. In there, the residuals look like more independent of the cost. So, so that's why you actually uh, say that this is the right of the direction. So we did apply it to many different problems in your in geosciences. Uh, where we actually have ground truth, so I think you can set out the precipitation and so on, but also in order to compare models with observational data, and also to assess what are the, the intrinsic parameters that you have to see uh, relative to the models to behave like more realistically, more constantly uh, motivated. And the results are kind of good. When it's uh, not super fantastic, you have uh, AUCs of 06, 07, or something like that, quite uncertain, of course. But the community is evolving of these uh, this, uh, binary problems uh, very, very dramatically in the last in the last five years. I would say that there are like, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of papers evolving this idea to detect um, the right uh, direction. Yeah, and I wanted to finalize with this um, field that we are super excited in, in Valencia that uh, basically joins forces of deep learning, climate sciences, and society. So why not? <laughs> and um, the main motivation is, is not just the tech position, but to learn feature representations that are cost. Okay, which is a different thing. And uh, the method should be amenable, should be useful in the end, practical for the data cubes that we get that are spatial temporally correlated. No? In this case, for example, in this in this picture, in this cartoon, um, you have some regions, some variables, for example, temperature on the right on the left and precipitation on the right, um, that are mutually crossing each other on different time scales. And you can see that the, the connections are also not only uh, positive or negative, but also uh, you know time dependent. So something crosses something uh, at different time scales. So so it is quite a complicated problem because the processes or the causation happens at different spatial temporal relationships and, and in different multivariate in different, different multivariate environments. Right? So what we did here was uh, uh, this approach. Uh, this is the the problem that we are concerned about. So again, what happens? Uh, what are the causal drivers of ENSO, of El Nino, again, two times you have a time series that is summarizing the, the surface temperature of Russia and the, the Pacific Ocean, and how is this actually, this anomaly is impacting uh, greenness in Africa, which there's a lot of debate and, and, and many papers debating about what are the actual regions impacting by this event. So we have cubes and we have time series, right? And, and this is the, the, the algorithm that we just came up with. So, so the algorithm is very simple. So you have an, an encoded decoder. Then you learn a latent representation. This encoded decoder just learns to yeah, reproduce or replicate or reconstruct the, the cubes of MDBI, the representation index. But then on top of that, we want that this latent representation should be causal. But Granger causal. Okay. So you can design the Granger causal, the, the Granger causal index, right? It is basically a ratio of the variances of the residuals that go in one direction and going in uh, in the direction of the latent representation should explain itself, or versus the latent representation should be predicted from kids past plus and so right so you compute this as a ratio plug it as a one more term in the in the, in the loss 
And then our swingers, of course, and then you expect that the, yeah, the later representation should be going to console. Okay. Yes. On the one side, we're going to see the one ratio, not the one dimension, we do twice. One ratio and the other one. Uh, good question. Good question. I think that we <laughs> one, but this actually has been changing quite a, quite a lot in the, <laughs> in the last weeks, I would say. Uh, because we are no longer, for example, we are no longer using out and colors, but the edge mode and colors. Yeah. At the very beginning, we only use one, one latent. And we are now introducing a combination of latent. So, so yeah, but concerning the index, I think that we are only using one. Okay, yeah, and the edge. Yeah. Yeah, because in principle, you know that yeah, you should assume something that tensor precedes the index, right? So in this case. And if it fails, it's yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, But in any case, you are incorporating this parameter, beta. In this case, that can trim down uh, the impact of the wind across mm -hmm. all the time. And actually, it fits kind of uh, reasonably well. So it is very sensitive, of course, but. Uh, uh, you can achieve written representations that are more similar to the answer or not, right? By tuning this parameter. Okay? And then, and then what? Okay, again, we are facing this deep learning architecture and you have late level representations, but okay, you get these crazy funky curves and then what, right? So we need to know, right? right? So what we did is, yeah, explain what we are. So now in this little master monster, we have everything. We have facility, explainable AI, deep learning, yeah, everything, right? So we apply uh, integrated gradients on the encoder because in principle, the encoder has been trained to be not only yeah, good for finding another later representation that we construct one, but also that everything is right? So yeah, you apply the, the integrated gradients so, so you can derive uh, Maps, explicit, especially explicit maps uh, of causal interaction. And then, of course, it is nice because you can uh, see the differences on the right, on the, on the top uh, versus on the bottom. Uh, you don't have this bring the cost uh, um, uh, impact. Um, it, it, it impacts right, right, noticeably. Then, then you can find some regions that are actually affected and that there were not um, that there were not reported before, right? And then you can go and analyze. By biome, let's say by types of forest, types of vegetation, and you can say something like that. Okay, but causality is not easy. It is not really easy. And it is very typically tailored to a particular application domain. So, what we decided is to, yeah, to promote this, uh, this uh, platform that we are developing. And this platform allows you not only to evaluate models, but now we very, very, very soon we'll be able also to. Train causal models itself and allow interaction with the user. So, in principle, the idea is that yeah, you will be able to upload your data set, the other platform analyzes the data set, proposes some sort of yeah, a bunch of causal uh, of crops or graphs, and allows you to interact with the user, which is the, who is the expert in this case, and allows you to evaluate the system as possible. But feel free to use. And you can download current data, apply your cross of graphs, uh, cross of discovery method. And then upload the solution, and since we know the ground truth, we can evaluate it. And that brings me to the end of this of this lecture. Um, yeah, the main conclusion is obvious. This is not enough. Uh, and I would like just to end up with uh, reminding you this three sentences, very very um, very common in statistics and machine learning. Right, the first one, you know that you can be right for the wrong reason. So that is actually calling for you know more plausible, more consistent physics awareness machine learning. Uh, the second one is a standard box uh, uh, sentence or this pattern saying that all models are wrong, some are useful. Yeah, but what is useful is if you don't know what the model is actually doing, right? So it is actually calling for experimental AI. And the third one is an informal one that is typically heard on ICL and RIG that people say, come on, AI is not that deep learning. So artificial intelligence is much more than just fitting, right? So let's go into into you know helping um, uh, process discovery algorithms or learn an abstraction. So or is that a, a possible representation? So yeah. 
get this shot and it goes on to the tents and everything. Thank you very much.